Welcome to the Connect with County Leaders podcast with your host, Brian Hill. Hello and welcome to Connect with County Leaders. I'm Brian Hill and it's my esteemed pleasure to have Randy Clark with me today. Randy Clark is the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority Executive Director. Is that what it is? Executive Director? Uh, General Manager and CEO. But it's just the term. It doesn't... Just a dude that works at Metro. So that's why I wanted you to tell me that. There you go. Because that's more words behind the title. There you go. So they must pay you really good. Uh, well, <laughs> alphabet soup. Go hey, I hear yeah, you yeah, loud yeah. and clear. But, Randy, you joined with Modern July of last year, and it's been yep. a tumultuous time. After serving as president of the Capitol Metro in Austin, you know, why don't you share with us your overall perspective on this transit system after your 15 months versus maybe Austin? Yeah, listen, Brian. Thanks for having me on. It's, it's my pleasure, to, fun, fun to see you as always. Um, cool you, kind of podcast. You say that. Doing. You say that as fun to see me as always. There's times it was not fun to see. Well, you. All, listen, man. We got we got jobs that we you know <laughs> partnership working together. To, yeah. If they were challenging, uh, everyone could do it, right? That's so, right. You That's know, right. We're all working together to get things done. So uh, listen, I'm super fortunate to have the role of Metro. Metro is obviously. Uh, you know, so critical to the region. We're the national capital region, so uh, a special responsibility that way. Um, you know, all transit systems are a little different. The one I ran in Austin, smaller system, but a very, very fast-growing area. Mm -hmm. We actually put together a big uh, system plan, won a referendum. So it's almost like D.C. area 20 years ago in the sense of building the infrastructure, right. although the city is gigantic comparatively. Uh, I worked at the Boston system for a long time, years ago. Um, so, you know, I've been around the business my whole career. I love transit industry. Mm -hmm. What's unique about Metro is that we have a governance model that is totally different than any other place. We have board members and therefore funding from four different jurisdictions. That's like nowhere else in the world. We have uh, a system that goes through three different states, which is not no place else in the world. Uh, we have no dedicated predictable funding source that uh, is with, at, at the transit agency, which is very different than most, most systems. Uh, and obviously then we transport the federal workforce and the visitors to the national capital. We're part of the national security mm -hmm. kind of infrastructure. Mm -hmm. You know, we serve the Pentagon and TSA headquarters and FBI and everything else you could think of. We work with Secret Service and F the Capitol Police every day. Um, so, yeah, you know, we're touching the two national airports. So it's, it's uh, an amazing system, but obviously super complex and uh, a lot of uniquenesses, uh, both good and bad that way. So when you were in Austin, I mean, is Aust Austin's above ground, right? Uh, yeah, there's no subway. There's no uh, subway. The plan, we put a referendum together to, to build a subway, and obviously they're, they're working through all of cool. that kind of stuff at the moment. So do you think having a system where it would be more light rail would be a little bit more conducive to our area here, or do you think we just need to figure out a way to build on what we currently have? In a, in, and if you say build on what we currently have, how would you go about building on it? Cause yeah, that's a, that's a super complex question. So that's obviously we do. have a, a heavy rail system, which is – uh, more, much more superior than light rail to move large volumes of people, mm -hmm. uh, which we need to in a region like this. So it's very like New York, Boston, other other big cities like that. Uh, there are segments that we probably could do more light rail in this region. Mm -hmm. So a good example is uh, right now Maryland is building, not WMATA, Maryland is building uh, Purple Line, which is light rail <laughs> between uh, New Carrollton connecting ultimately through Silver Sp College Park, Silver Spring yeah. to Bethesda. I think, you know, as a region grows, I think, uh, you know, a lot of people talk about should we ultimately have a light rail that runs from Bethesda to Tyson's, two massive activity centers. Um, there's other other elements that people are thinking about light rail as well. On the heavy rail side, we're going through this kind of blue, orange, silver study right now. We have a big problem when all three lines get to Roslyn. We have a congestion issue between Roslyn all the way to Stadium Armory. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't allow us to have any resiliency in the system. So we could have a medical incident, uh, like say someone having a heart attack, for example, on a train, and all three lines are impacted, as an example. Or if we try to do maintenance work, they're all impacted. So part of that study area, like a good example would be uh, National Harbor on the Maryland side, connecting maybe back into uh, like the Huntington area is a good example of where uh, I think there's an overwhelming amount of people who want to see a connection like that. The bridge was built to handle uh, Metro Rail to do that. Uh, there's people that want to see, you know, I get asked all the time, when are we going to extend to this building here is a good example, uh, like Centerville, Vienna out to Centerville. You got asked that like five minutes ago. Right? You know, so there's all <laughs> these things that people would like to do. Um, but as you know, yeah, they all require money. And right yeah. now we're all a little short on that. Well, I agree with that. And, you know, you, you made it in your intro. You kind of said that 
we have a, a lot of funding sources that we have to think about. So just so everybody knows in Virginia, Alexandria, Loudoun, Arlington, and Fairfax have a portion of the pay. Yep. Then you add the Commonwealth. So we have five sources right here in, in, in Virginia. Then you have Maryland, like you said. Mm-hmm. You have D.C., mm-hmm. and then you have the feds. Yep. Obviously in— Simple. Yeah, I mean— you know, I don't know who would ever think about doing a system like this, but it's a needed system because of where we are. Yep. We are working hand in hand with um, our partners in Alexandria, Loudoun, Arlington, Fairfax, and D- and um, um, DC. We do believe there's a way, but we have a structural problem. So, what are your what's your role, or what have you seen in a way of fixing the structural problem? Because it can't just be funding and. We'll, we'll talk about funding in the, in the future, but if you had a chance to redo how Metro was running when you walked in the door, what are the things you would have went at first and foremost? Yeah, well, I mean, you could we could do a podcast for the last 40, we'll 40 get, days we'll get for 25 that. 25 minutes, so, man. So yeah, so, <laughs> I mean, uh, the structural problem is the money, though. So the money was never set up in a way to allow Metro to fully think through and being the public service the Metro is. At the end of the day, that's what we got to get everyone grounded upon. Metro, uh, and I do find it surprising even in uh, a very mature region mm-hmm. that we are in, some people still uh, think somehow that we make money and that there's profit. We're a public service, and so I say, well, how much did the fire department or the schools make last year? And when you say that, it kind of gets a light bulb going off. That's what we are. We're a public service. We happen to charge fares that make up a, a, a very small percent of the overall uh, budget, mm-hmm. but we, we are relying on tax dollars in the region to, to fund it. Um, so, you know, I think a lot of people have talked about governance. I, I always make sure I, I disconnect board members for governance. We have a fantastic group of board members, very caring. Uh, they're, they're not in it for any personal gain. That's for sure. That's a, it's a very hard job for no, for no compensation. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. it's a volunteer to make their community better. Uh, but. The governance model is a little strange considering, again, four jurisdictions. We also don't have capital set up correctly, mm-hmm. and they were kind of disconnected operating in capital. And I think in some ways we got to bring those back together and think about how it's one financial model. Uh, there's not a lot of resiliency in the dedicated funding that is existing now. So COVID is a good example where we had massive inflationary pressures, just like you would hear at Fairfax. Right. The difference is we don't have any levers to raise the revenue to deal with the inflationary pressures. Sure. So there's all that kind of stuff we're working on. Um, you know, the stations are built the way they are. Whether <laughs> they should should have all been built that way in the past is kind of irrelevant. We got to run the system as efficiently as we possibly can. Uh, what I am excited about is the volume of development in this region that is transit-oriented. If you look at it, overwhelmingly, the uh, 70% of the population of the region lives within a half a mile of a metro station. Uh, overwhelming amount of jobs, all of the new construction, big apartment buildings, Fortune 500. We are the economic driver of the region. Mm-hmm. Uh, 3% of the land uh, of the region is within a half a mile of metro, uh, which makes up almost a third of the tax base for the region. 3% equals 30%. And uh, so, you know, if we don't have a well-functioning metro, we don't have a well-functioning region. Um, And I think universally everyone kind of knows that. Uh, The other thing we got to get everyone aligned on is if you don't take metro, you certainly want everyone else to be on metro. Because (laughs) if you think traffic in the DMV is bad now, and it really is, right? Part of the challenge we have is traffic is back to COVID levels, pre-COVID levels. And we got to get more and more people on transit systems yeah. to get people off the road for all the people that don't have the option of using transit. So if you have a small business and you know an electrician with a van, or you're doing deliveries or all these other jobs that are not transit based, you don't want to be sitting in traffic all day long, let alone ambulances and all this other kind of stuff. Well, the good thing, the good thing about Metro is, uh, in, in from my perspective, and I think most of the folks in Northern Virginia's perse- perspective, is that you were here when we opened the Silver Line. So you yep. got you got you got a lot of press on that Silver Line. It pre- we had a great day on the Silver Line, and uh, it's been really good since. And you know what a bar- what a partnership. I yeah. mean, you know, you guys played a big role in that. Uh, Emwa, Jack, and the team out of the airport did fantastic. Loudoun County. Um, I'm really excited. So just a couple of weeks ago, we celebrated our millionth customer at the airport, which is a big deal for it's us. Huge. Three million people have taken the Silver Line extension, so from Wheelie to mm-hmm. Ashburn. Uh, Ashburn is really doing very well as well. It's our second highest ridership behind Dulles. 
Uh, we're getting almost 5,000 people, it is, I think, a day going yeah. out of Dulles, which is great. And the weekends are doing really well, too. Uh, we've gained every month since we've opened. Um, and so as the Silver Line service now is running what it was supposed to, we finally, you know, it took a long time to get to back yeah. to 10-minute and then 10 and 12-minute off-peak. We were running pretty bad service. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so now that we're running good service, you could really see a lot of people using, and I think that's just going to keep growing from there. Well, absolutely, we'll keep growing. As Jack Potter with MWA, he's moving forward with a new I guess you'd call it wing of Dulles Airport. I think they have a terminal expansion. New terminal yeah, expansion. I, I think I just uh, I think that's gonna go really soon. Actually. And that is gonna be another twenty to thirty um, um, gates yep. associated with United, who is growing expeditiously there. So that should also help ridership with the Silver Line. It's all connected together, yeah. right? Like, so whether you're an employee at the airport that's selling coffee to someone at 7 in the morning to you're a traveler to you're a flight uh, you know, attendant, it doesn't matter. Uh, the part about this that I find interesting is Dulles Airport, I saw, grew the most of any airport in the country last year on mm -hmm. international flight, yeah. uh, um, of tr flight travel. And the number one thing they cited was the access to the Silver Line. So, again, this goes back to the economic dr driver of the region. It also, to me, goes back to the funding challenge, which is, I mean, as a region, are we going to take 60 years to build a rail line and then not run trains on the rail line that we just spent billion dollars, billions of dollars to build? And I would like to think as a region we are too sophisticated to know uh, how closely these things are linked. And the second we impact one, we are going to impact the other. Well, you do realize uh, as a region we're on board with what you – are trying to do and accomplish because we are there with you and we meet regularly. But as a region, I have a second or a third wheel called the state. And how have your deliberations been with uh, our governor's office or uh, director of transportation? Because that MBTA funding is going to be key to us as we move forward. Yeah, so you guys have a complexity here. So when I talk about the region, I mean like Richmond to Annapolis or okay, whatever for right, me. I mean, right. listen, they're all partners to me, so I don't get caught in the – see, uh, a lot of people have – like I'm the only kind of like thing that is the regional thing. Everyone else has a jurisdictional thing, meaning I don't um, – I don't have boundaries the same way. So what I'm trying to do is just work with anyone and all yeah. people. But what I say to you, what I say that to you is that again, um, DC, um, Kevin yep. in DC, Mark Schwartz in Arlington. Uh, sorry, Kevin Donahue. I don't want him not yeah. to get his due. Uh, Tim Hemstreet in Loudon, um, Jim Parajan in Alexandria. We view ourselves as Northern Virginia region. Well, regionally, that's where the metro is. I can't add. Uh, my friends down in James right. City and Newport News. I just want to make sure for context purposes, we have a, as you once cited, Frankenstein yeah, I type of funding we source. Do, we do have a kind of Frankenstein yeah. model. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah. So Frankenstein I'm, was loved by some people too. You know? Bella Lugosi maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just trying to figure out how your your your, your talks down in, in, in Richmond have gone and if there's anything we can do in the Northern Virginia region to help help with those talks down in Richmond. Yeah, I mean, listen, we're, we're engaged at a very granular level with uh, especially the Secretary of Transportation and, uh, and appreciate his leadership and wanting to be highly involved. Uh, we had the Commonwealth Transportation Board meeting up here at Crystal City a week ago. Yeah. Uh, the Governor's Transportation Conference was also here last week. Uh, there was a, uh, a, a joint committee of transportation, joint transportation committee between the House and the Senate here. Um, the, the Senate, uh, Senator Marzen happens to be a Northern Virginia leader, yeah. but uh, uh, the chair of transportation in the House is, uh, is Delegate Austin, and mm -hmm. he's not from Northern Virginia, but mm -hmm. they're all unified with the same message, which is uh, we got to make Metro work. Uh, Metro's too important for the region and the Commonwealth's economy and, and all of our goals, uh, you know, whether they're climate goals or equity goals or economic goals. Uh, so universally, everyone understands the importance of Metro, uh, so we feel really good that way. Uh, there, there's obviously a political question that is different <laughs> that it's not metro's role to figure out here between northern virginia and the state as a whole um and i expect that between the state delegation regional leaders and the uh, overall administration those things will all get worked out uh for us we, uh, we just want to be transparent what the facts yeah. are and uh you know hopefully everyone can work together well you have a large job a large job um you do we talked about metro so much today I'm going to transition a little bit. Okay, yeah. All right, because we've been doing some really good things with the bus network. So you know the importance of a strong bus network. How Here in Fairfax County, our connected services 
work seamlessly with your system. I'm hoping they work more seamlessly than they did in years past. Tell us more about the Better Bus Initiative. Yeah, so uh, listen, bus is the is the foundation of all transit, no matter where you are. You could be in New York City, and the bus system is still crazy important, just like it is here, right? So uh, the Better Nus Bus Network project is really about how do you kind of get the network to look like what it should in 2023 versus a network from you know 1955 that kind of just piecemeal changed. We have a clearly a different looking region and therefore parts of the region than it were that it was 15 20 30 years ago so we got to update our routes and where they go big activity centers hospitals schools job employment centers things of that nature so uh, we're doing that on a regional basis obviously Fairfax connectors uh, you know really important regional player and all of those things what we want to do is get more and more people on transit period I don't really care what mm -hmm. what what flag they fly per se I want people on VRE, I want them on Mark Trains, I want them on Metro, I want them on Fairfax Connector, I want them on Dash, Art, you name it. Uh, we need more people using transit uh, if we care about our regional goals. Well, we do have a lot of regional goals. We have a lot of power here in what I call Northern Virginia, Maryland, D.C., the DMV. With you coming on board, you brought a breath of fresh air. And we, uh, the Northern Virginia um, CAOs, really appreciate that. But I'm I am one of the Northern Virginia CEOs that uh, that was, I would say, happy to announce that we plan to convert Cinderbed Bus Garage. And you helped me. You were the spearhead of that to exclusively serve electric buses, an initiative that aligns with our county environmental goal of carbon neutrality by 2040. So when you when you do things like that, which you gave really positive press to my board. What's the outline for WMATA zero emission environmental goal and your strategies moving forward? Because this initiative is not going to be an initiative that is free. It's going to take a lot of money to do it. It does, yeah. And we talked we talked about Metro earlier about the the, the, the I should say the the gap in funding. Mm -hmm. How do we get to here? Yeah, no, listen, Brian, that's a great question. And I, you know, I want to thank you, uh, your team here at the county, uh, and the electoral leadership, too. I mean, this is a really cool partnership. It's mm -hmm. why we won this grant. We won a $104 million Federal Transit Administration grant, the largest in the country last year. And we won it because of a partnership. So that garage serves our fleet, but it's also uh, home for this future uh, BRT fleet that you are, you're all building um, as well. So I think that joint partnership and how we're working together was a big factor. I was mm -hmm. told it was a very big factor by the feds <laughs> on that. So it's a big deal. Uh, and so, you know, you and others brought a lot of leadership to the partnership on that. When it comes to overall zero emission transition for Metro, we got big challenges. Uh, it is big, big money. Um, what we got to ground everyone first is, and I don't care how, if you're the most, you know, adamant environmentalist of all time or, you, you know, in the far end and you somehow uh, – I illogically don't believe climate change exists. Mm -hmm. One way or the other, more people on transit is the most environmental thing versus the propulsion system. Okay. So I will take 40 people on a diesel bus over four people on electric bus all day, every day. Uh, a diesel bus is more environmentally friendly than electric cars. We need more people on transit. Then we need to actually work on making our, our system greener. And so we are doing that. We have two garages in DC right now that we're building and converting. We're going to be doing the Cinderbad retrofit because of this grant, uh, but this is you know, 104 million. Uh, we have a goal at Metro of 2042 as the transition. I will tell you, I think with our current funding, that probably is going to go backwards. Um, that revives a lot of capital, not just buying the vehicles; it's the retrofits of these garages. It's a much more complicated than someone that <laughs> is not in the industry, and I get that a lot of advocates are pushing us, and rightfully, that's what advocates do. They're supposed to push, yeah. and I respect that. Uh, but we don't have a utility network set up in a grid set up across America and this region to handle this yet. If everyone just had electric cars and we had electric buses tomorrow, the grid can't handle that. It's just such a change so quickly. So I am worried that we don't have the capital funding to get where we want to get at the timeline. Yeah. But we are committed to getting so there. Isn't this isn't this one of those times where you and I both wish we were back in Canada where we just get into Toronto and get into the in, into the bus that has the electric grid on top and we're good to go? Uh, catenary. So there's some of those <laughs> around still, and those are really good. Uh, obviously, what do you call those? Uh, well, you got a pantograph and a, ca yeah. a catenary system. So 
um, you know, but kind of mostly on on trains. But you know, they uh, the these are the old bo- the, yeah. the, the 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 overhead bus charging. So there's some cities that have those. We had some of those in Boston. <laughs> mostly they're old streetcars. Yeah, they just got converted over. So there's none in this region right at the moment. There's a few cities that have some left. Um, Seattle actually has a decent network of them. Yeah. Uh, so not everyone likes those either because then you got physical like. You know, you got things in the sight line and whatnot, but they are actually even easier to operate in one way. Um, so uh, all this stuff is complex, right? Oh, and let's bring, bring in the world of Randy now. We need Randy Clark to blow it up. <laughs> it. I mean, you know. Yeah, well, the first, like, listen, if there's the blow up, I, I, I'll tell people, like, the zero emission bus is great. <laughs> More people on the bus is way better. Um, and that means we got to get people's behavior changed. We need more people on transit, less people driving by themselves, uh, more people. That's why also going to office is a good thing. So not everyone loves this idea, but offices are innately efficient right. because people go to one place in an efficient manner. Right. Therefore, office buildings are more actually environmentally efficient. People work more efficiently. Efficient. Yeah. Um, you know, all these things are connected together. I'm also convinced, Brian. So, you know, like... We had our be- best Monday uh, of the pand- uh, since post-pandemic. Yesterday, Tuesday, was our highest uh, rail since the pandemic. Today, I think we're going to break uh, our Wednesday, which would be our highest since the pandemic. September was our le- uh, best month mm-hmm. since the pandemic. Uh, last year, we led the country in year-over-year ridership increase. So the momentum of Metro is coming. There's no question. We're running really good service yeah. right now. In a lot of places, best service we've ever run. Um, what we got to do is figure out how to keep that momentum going, and that means that kind of predictable funding and working through that. But, you know, um, it's all about partnerships at the end of the day. We, we got we to gotta all of us figure out how to prioritize these investments. Well, you know, Clark Mercer is going to say he wrote the letter to the OMB about um, getting people back in the office. Mm-hmm. All right, so the guy that wrote the letter is in this room okay. with you today. Well, there's only two of us, so, right. and yeah, I but, didn't. And I'm going to say that. Clark's a great guy, a uh, cog. Uh, director, <laughs> and yeah. we we worked we worked on that letter together, because li- literally the federal government has no policies about coming to work. Well, they have there's clear uh, policies. I, I listen. I, I we don't run in those places, so I think you know. Like, I, I think what I want to focus on is this. I got to. I believe. Or, well, I I would look at it this way. I believe organizations work better when people are connected to the mission. <laughs> Period. <laughs> Right. So my first week at Metro, <laughs> people came back to the office. Of course, because I they, believe they read my memo. I believe they are going to be better connected to the, the mission. Yeah. So we have some flexibility, right? Like yeah, not every person needs five, but overwhelming of, of the workforce I work with is operational. We're twenty four seven, three sixty five. Never, yeah. never take a never take a day away from the quote unquote office. Yeah. Other people have to be engaged in the mission. Who I feel bad for in this com- conversion that we're in a little bit is younger employees. They're the ones in. They want to learn and grow from from uh, more tenured employees. They're looking for on the job training. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're looking to be mentored. Yeah. Uh, and I think if we don't acknowledge that head on, we are going to have serious long term workforce development problems. People innately work better better when they are people. together and more innovation when they're together. But that also doesn't mean that everyone has to sit in a cube, you know, tw- twenty four uh, hours, twenty eighty yeah. for yeah. the year. Yeah, so I got you. I appreciate you and others' leadership on that. We. You know, our region is the federal capital, and we need an engaged federal uh, workforce and a federal government, and we need that on metro topics and economic development yeah. laws. I mean, you know, it, 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 there's so many things that we could do to entice and bring people back to work, but yet we don't want to upset the apple cart. Some yeah. don't want to upset the apple cart. Um, I'm going to say this to you. We're, we're behind metro because we understand the the need for Metro. We understand that we need you to be successful. We need Metro to be successful because with those two successes, I look at the silver line, there's going to be a lot of growth on the silver line. Yeah. Then it, you know, one millionth customer on, uh, it hasn't even been open a year yet. Yeah. Pretty good stuff. As we move forward and as we close, are there any other nuggets of information other than Frankenstein and Bella yeah. Lugosi? <laughs> are there any other nuggets of, of information you want to provide? 
project onto onto the onto the viewers of uh, this podcast. Yeah, listen, one, thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. And it is, I think we have a great partnership between mm-hmm. Metro and Fairfax. Uh, I want to keep doubling down on that where we're not doing well. I would say to a listener or viewer, I guess it's both podcast and video, listen, we are trying to run the best possible Metro system for this region. We are going to have days where it's not perfect. Yeah. What I'm trying to bring to the table is an acknowledgement and a transparency around what we do. Uh, we got to own when we don't do well, but I'm also going to celebrate and celebrate loudly when we do well. I'm going to celebrate our 12,000 individual work for, workforce that is working real hard for this region every day. We have people that, just like you and operational government, 24-7, 365, snow days, hot days, we're shutting down and doing hard work in the middle of rain yeah. and sunny. Um, you know, but here, here's the stuff I really want people in the region to think about. If we want to have a quality of life region, so even if you only use Metro, say, once a week, yeah. okay, there's no funding Metro on a Wednesday. I need to have Metro funded seven, seven days, days a week. week. If mm-hmm. you only use Metro f- for during the week, the Metro needs to exist on the weekend. Mm-hmm. If you only want to take it to Dulles twice a year, you got to work. When you only want to go to the mall for j- f- July 4th and, and one Nats game a year, it has to work the other 363. Right. We have as a community mm-hmm. uh, to uh, arguably one of the best assets in America and let's not let that asset fall apart now. Uh, we put too much into this. And, you know, we got some big things coming up here, Brian, and not, not too far. We got inauguration coming up, <laughs> right, which is not that far away. We have World Pride, which is basically equivalent economic-wise to a Super Bowl, mm-hmm. but lasts over a week. We got to be prepared as a region for these things, and we can't fall a metro apart for a year, turn a dial, and it comes back. Well, I do want to ask. These things don't turn like yeah, that. I do want to ask for a temporary metro station going into GMU because we have a cricket world championship. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're going to have to bring you on that. <laughs> I mean, and that's not a, that's the true story there. Yeah. But, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you heard it from his mouth to your ears. Randy Clark, uh, by way of Nova Scotia. Yep. Wamada CEO, uh, thanks for listening, and I look forward to joining joining me again next month, uh, whoever that's going to be. I believe uh, we're doing either public safety or the environment. Uh, thanks again for listening to Connect with County Leaders. Thank you, Brian. Thanks, Brian. Appreciate, Appreciate it, man. Yeah. This has been the Connect with County Leaders podcast with Fairfax County Executive Brian Hill. To listen to other great Fairfax County podcasts, visit fairfaxcounty.gov slash podcasts. And for additional audio content, tune in to Fairfax County Government Radio at fairfaxcounty.gov slash radio. For more Fairfax County news and information, visit News Center online at fairfaxcounty.gov slash news. The Connect with County Leaders podcast is produced by the Fairfax County, Virginia government.